Hi, you guys. So usually I film a bunch of B-roll before I actually sit down with my cup of tea to talk to you guys about whatever it is I feel like talking to you guys about that day, which basically just means that I put my camera on my tripod and I film a little shot of the cabin and I film a little shot of me filling the bird feeder or I'll film a couple shots of me like making a cup of tea to lead into coming in to sit down and chat with you guys. But this morning I literally just like didn't have the energy for it and I just wanted to sit down and get into it. I wanted to talk about the apartment that just Jesse and I first moved into when we moved out to the Kootenays together with our, or my, three little pugs, Jonas, Fern, and Ivy in the spring of 2020. Jesse met me, actually Jesse and I met in grade five, but that's a story I'll get into at another time as well. So Jesse and I have known each other for a very long time, but Jesse and I reconnected for the first time as adults since we saw each other last at our high school graduation in 2004. We reconnected connected in January of 2020 and we all know what happened in the spring of 2020. That was when the pandemic first officially reared its ugly head. And uh, the story of moving out to the Kootenays with Jesse is very much my pandemic story. Like everybody has their pandemic story and I feel like COVID just created a new life for so many people. So many people, like the COVID pandemic stories out there of how everything affected people at that time. I feel like it was just a new chapter for a lot of people. And my story, my pandemic story is <laughs> it's a good one. I was actually recovering from an ileostomy reversal procedure, a very long, long awaited and dramatic wait for an ileostomy reversal procedure. So I was recovering. I was on short-term disability at the time. So I wasn't working and Jesse and I reconnected at the beginning of the year. I had three pugs at the time, Jonas, Fern and Ivy. So that was when he came into our lives. And in March of 2020, it was Jesse's birthday. It was also my birthday. We share a birthday month and we spent our birthdays together and then the pandemic arrived and we became kind of like lockdown partners. He ended up just staying at my apartment with the pugs and shit was just going crazy in the world and after probably a few weeks of just hanging out at my apartment together and uh, spending time with Jonas and Fern and Ivy and all of my pug walking clients at the time, he pitched or proposed the idea that we just get the fuck out of Calgary and move to the Kootenai and I had never heard of, well, I had heard of the Kootenays before um, once, that's a that's another story, but I wasn't familiar with the Kootenays really at all. And I had never once considered like living there. I didn't really know much about it or how it works out here, the kind of environment, the type of people that are out here. Like I didn't really know much about it at all. So when he proposed that we move out there together after only technically dating for a few weeks officially, I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, of course, the world is like literally insane right now. I was living downtown Calgary, like next to the Calgary Tower, downtown Calgary. I was a couple blocks off of 17th Avenue. I was living by myself in a little apartment at the time with Jonas, Fern and Ivy. And uh, I had been through more than most people go through in their lifetimes at that point, after having lived in the city for probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years at that point. Anyways, I said, yes, we took a sneaky pandemic trip over to the Kootenays so Jesse could kind of take me on a tour and show me around the area. We weren't supposed to be traveling at that time. And this was at that time when like roadside um, outhouses and bathrooms were like locked. Like you couldn't get into any public bathrooms. And like, this was when people were stocking up on toilet, toilet paper and like things were just so fucking weird. We took a sneaky trip uh, out to the Kootenays um, so that I could experience it. This was in April. And uh, we spent um, a few days here. Jesse showed me around. And when we got back, I just decided to start packing up my stuff and I sold my car and I got rid of a lot of my things. And we just, packed up everything and drove out at the end of May. So we arrived here on June 1st. So I explained that to kind of like set the, the scene or set the uh, circumstances for the apartment that we found when we moved out here. So finding a place to live out here is not easy. I get that there's like a housing crisis and like a rental crisis, like literally everywhere. I don't, well, I live in Canada, so I'm, I'm more familiar with like the, the uh, climate, <laughs> the housing climate and crisis in Canada specifically. In BC, 
it's really bad. It, it wasn't just recently that that happened. Like I remember even back when I was an Albertan, like back in Alberta, I was always like, everyone just always knew how difficult it was to find housing out in British Columbia. It's extremely expensive. Some people say that BC stands for bring cash. It is just a really, really expensive province. And the housing crisis I feel like has been going on here for a really long time. We live in the interior. The Kootenays is in the interior, but you usually always hear about Vancouver, which is the big Vancouver and Victoria, the big cities on the, the actual coast of Brit the West coast of British Columbia. As long as I can remember for years, I was always aware of just this housing crisis in BC. So it's not easy to find somewhere to live here. It's not something that you can really just go on like rent faster and find something. What I've learned <laughs> just from hearing people talk around me and being a part of the little village Facebook groups that you have to join to stay in the loop about everything that's going on in this area is people are constantly struggling to try and find housing for themselves and their families. And it doesn't happen by searching. It happens by word of mouth. That's the only way that you can find somewhere to live out here. So Jesse has had a connection to the Kootenays for a while. He, his family lives out here. His parents moved out here. I don't know when, like a, a while ago. So he's, he's spent some time over the past, like since we graduated in 2004, he's spent some time out here in the Kootenays. And he was essentially like bringing me out here to an area that he was already familiar with. So he had a couple of contacts. He had a couple of, of uh, like photography and videography clients. He had, you know, his mom and his sister and his family are all kind of out here, right? So he, sort of had the connections or the, the network. It's not a very like big network, but through his work, his photography and videography work, he did know people. And so he found the apartment that we moved into through word of mouth from his kind of bread and butter videography and photography client who is actually an established real estate agent out here in the West Kootenays. So Jesse uh, worked on a project with her selling a massive hotel in Caslow, the Caslow Hotel. He did like a big videography project featuring that hotel to sell the Caslow Hotel. And that's how he knew her. And so she actually owned a property on Caslow's Front Street, uh, Main Street. It's called Front Street. It's the one tiny little main drag. Whenever I talk to you guys about like going into town, that's where I'm going is down to Caslow as we obviously don't live there anymore. The cabin is not in Caslow. It's just outside of it. She owned a property there right on Front Street, directly across from the SS Moyi. I'm in love with the SS Moyi. It's um, the Kootenay's oldest sternwheeler. It's this massive, white, beautiful boat. It's part of the Caslow Historical Society. They like fundraise for it and they do restorations on it and they just keep it in like tip top shape. And it's actually a museum inside and you can like blow the foghorn up in the like little, with the you know, the wheel, <laughs> I don't know, like boat terms, but I just love this boat. So it's this massive, beautiful boat. It's dry docked on the North shore of Kootenay Lake. And the apartment that we moved into that this real estate agent owned was called the 1896 building. And anyone in the area has a story about the 1896 building because it's just this historical old building that has been around since 1896. And it was a really unique building itself. It was had a, a red brick exterior. It was very like vintage, but it was right on Front Street. So it was right on Caslow's main strip with all the coffee shops. Well, there's one coffee shop, the coffee shop, the microbrewery was right next to us called the Angry Hen. And then there was the Blue Bell. And then there's the grocery store that I always go to in like the little strip of shops that just go down Caslow's Front Street. And then the SS Moyi was directly across from it. So our view out of our living room window was this big, gigantic, beautiful white stern wheeler with the like expanse of Kootenay Lake behind it and then the mountains and stuff like that. So we got hooked up with this apartment. It was a four unit apartment. We were in the back unit. The unit below us was actually this like dilapidated storage unit. So it had so much crap in there. I can't even begin to explain to you what was in there. The basement of it was a root cellar. So as we were living there, there was someone that would come in with a truck to bring down 
potatoes. We called them the potato people. So they would store like potatoes and onions and like root crops down there. But the unit below us was not like in any shape to be rented out or, or lived in or anything like that. It was just like old, like garbage and storage and shrapnel and um, just building supplies and random miscellaneous like pieces of furniture and um, and then potatoes and onions and stuff like that apparently too. So very strange that, you know, the windows were boarded up and stuff like that. So it was like completely just a write off of, of a space. So there were no tenants down there. So we lived upstairs with nobody beneath us. And then in the front, there was a little unit on top where there was just one person living there. And then the unit below was a bachelor suite. And we had seen a lot of turnaround in that spot. There was a couple of different tenants that lived there, a couple of different families that were moving in and moving out. It was commercially licensed. So it was a shop a couple of times. I think before we moved in, it was a bookstore. I hear a lot of people talking about how it used to be a bookstore and a lot of people have memories of that. I think it was a grocery store at one time or like a fish and tackle shop or something like that. At one point it was the office for a newspaper. That was when we were living there. So like there was a newspaper office in there. People always came and went out of that front unit, the realtor that owned it, rented it out as an Airbnb a couple of times as well. There was just a lot of like, it was very transient and like, we never knew what was going on in there. It was very strange space. So yeah, there was that one, there was that unit too. So us and then two other units and then kind of like this uh, root cellar storage unit beneath us. And so our unit faced the back alley that was looking out. I don't know what direction it was, but our, our unit faced away from the Moyi, but the windows on the side, we could see out towards the lake and towards the Moyi. So the realtor that Jesse Knew, gave us the keys to this place because they knew each other personally and they already trusted each other. It was a pretty easy move in process. There was no competition to get in there. There was no applications we had to fill out. There was no pet fee. She didn't care that, about the fact that we had three little dogs. That's the other thing is that with a rental crisis to begin with, it's hard to even think about trying to find a place with three dogs. Like there's just, there's no way. So we felt so just lucky and so grateful to have found this place given the current state of the rental market and just the housing crisis and, and all that stuff. So it all happened the way that it was supposed to and we were just so grateful for the location and the fact that we had a little lakeside apartment that overlooked Kootenai Lake and you know we could see this beautiful boat and like we just thought it was the best thing ever. We thought it was the best thing ever ever, ever, ever. We also moved out to Caslo and the Kootenays at a very unique time when there was literally zero tourism. This was in the spring of 2020. So it was very, 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 very quiet and very, very slow. And we had the entire place to ourselves. Like it was just this private little village, this sleepy, quiet, beautiful, pristine, wild little village that I felt like Jesse and I lived in by ourselves on our own. It was the best thing ever. It was so cool. So. We were really excited about this apartment. We were really proud to live there. We got an amazing deal on rent. Um, we were paying $750 a month to live there. It was a two bedroom unit. And uh, we were allowed to be there with our three little dogs. And it was just, it was amazing. Like we felt so lucky to be there. And whenever we did run into someone in town or they'd ask like who we were, like asked where we were from, we would always say that we live in the 1896 building and they would immediately know what that was and have a story about it or know someone who knew someone that lived there or know someone who knew someone who had a story about the 1896 building like it's just it's a legendary building in uh, in Caslo so it was really cool to be living there and to be able to talk about it uh, to people and tell them that we tell them that we lived there so we lived in this apartment from June of 2020 up until September of 2021 so it was about a year and a half Jesse and I lived in this apartment together with Jonas Fern and Ivy and in September of 2020 21, I had actually just graduated or finished a government funded self-employment program here in the Kootenays called Community Futures. That's where Grummel Farm kind of got its footing as an actual real registered business. I had graduated from the program, phase two of the program in September of 2021. And Grummel Farm was nowhere ready to support me on its own. So I panicked, <laughs> I, I fucking panicked. And I moved back to Calgary on my own. I like abandoned Jesse at the apartment. I packed up Jonas, Fern and Ivy and I moved back to Calgary so that I could do pet care and offer pet care services because the pandemic kind of seemed like it was sort of over at that point. In retrospect, I don't really think it was, but people were traveling again and like, you know, the breed specific pug care, the sitting and the walking and the boarding that I was doing in Calgary when I met Jesse in January of 2020, obviously came to a halt 
in March of 2020 when the pandemic arrived because everybody canceled their travel plans and everyone started working from home. So I had to stop doing that, which was another reason why I said yes to moving out to the Cooties because my business had kind of been obliterated. So registering in this self-employment program when I got to BC helped me figure out how to get Grumble Farm online and how to run it as an online business. But by the time the program ended, which had financial supports, it ended in September of 2021. I decided to move back to Calgary and move back to like somewhere with a bigger population so that I could offer pet care services again. I could do pug walking and, and pug sitting and boarding and, and whatever. I was panicking and I just needed a way to survive. And that was the only way that I knew how to do it. So I left Jesse in the apartment alone and I took Jonas Fern and Ivy and we drove back to Calgary. I found an apartment and we ended up staying there until June of 2022. So nine months is how long I abandoned abandoned Jesse for. So he stayed at the apartment by himself. He paid rent by himself in Caslow. And then I was paying rent for an apartment in the city. And looking back, that was the, it was the stupidest thing I ever did. <laughs> and so many fucked up things happened while I was there. Like you guys, this is going to be an episode of its own or several episodes when I get into making those episodes about um, the, the, the whole story. That period of time in Calgary from September of 2021 to June of 2022, it needed to happen. I needed to go back to Calgary to reconcile some identity stuff between like city brandy and Kootenai brandy. And uh, the, sh the shit that got shaken up and the shit that blew up and the shit that fell away and all of the chaos and the drama and uh, the stuff that happened in that nine months when I was out in the city, it was necessary. It was painful, but it was necessary. So that period of time, I want to say I regret it because I wish I would have just stayed in the Kootenays at the apartment with Jesse. But looking back, I understand the lessons and I understand why I went through what I went through. There was some big, big growth that happened there. But towards in, in around May of 2022, I was at a point where I realized that, or ha I had to find the confidence and the understanding about myself and my life and my my goals with Grumble Farm and and um, sort of where I was at with caregiving for the pugs and stuff like that. I, ha I had to find these answers to finally be at peace with disconnecting from the city and moving to the Kootenays full time. I feel like the first period of moving out there was kind of just like a test run and it was a difficult transition. Like it was a really, really hard transition. That was not easy. But anyways, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. I ended up moving back to the Kootenays and back to the 1896 apartment with Jesse, with Jonas Fern and Ivy in June of 2022 and actually the second I moved back is when Jonas really started showing his first symptoms of his decline so remember that he died in April of 2023 so I moved back in June 2022 so this was less than a year before he died but when we got back like seriously the week we got back he started to show his first symptoms that I, I didn't know were connected to his condition that we eventually diagnosed the following year but that was the time June 2022 when he started to to show some serious um, symptoms of, of decline with his body and, and with his health. So in June of 2022, we moved back into the apartment with Jesse and we basically just got back to work with Grumble Farm, living at the apartment, creating content and videos. I got really into making reels and short form content, just sucked it up and made some short form content on Instagram. We really started to grow at this time. And then I think we just wrote out the rest of 2022, just kind of grinding away. I was working on Grumble Farm's store and I was creating short form content and hanging out with our patrons and doing Zoom meets and just a whole bunch of Grumble Farm stuff. Like I was just trying every avenue I could to make it so that I could survive out in the Kootenays without access to doing service-based pet care and, and pug care work. Uh, I was just trying really, really hard. So the 2022 year came to a close at the apartment. At the beginning of 2023, it was Jonas's 13th birthday. So Jonas's 13th birthday was January 16th. 2023. And Jesse and I had decided to start the 2023 year by recommitting to YouTube as we just did again recently, but this was at the beginning of the year before we knew that Jonas was going to die. We decided to recommit to YouTube. So when we were in the apartment, we were hyper focused on creating YouTube videos. We were filming and editing and recording and uploading and sharing YouTube videos with so much like just motivation and inspiration and like momentum to get our YouTube channel growing. And so that was our focus at the beginning of the year. Jonas's birthday was on January 16th. We filmed a vlog about his birthday. And two days after on January 18th was the day that that was the beginning, the beginning of the end. 
was two days after his um, his birthday. He got really, really sick. And that was the day that marked the beginning of all of this back and forth between multiple vets, between British Columbia and Alberta to try and diagnose what was going on with him all the way up until the end of March, which is when I decided to book his euthanasia appointment. And then all the way through to the end of April, which was his actual Rainbow Bridge birthday. So our sort of stretch of being able to focus on creating YouTube videos ended at the same time that I got so stressed out with Jonas um, and quit Instagram and deleted TikTok. We couldn't create YouTube videos when he started to get really, really sick because all of my care went towards him. And it was just so high stress and so all consuming to care for a palliative stage little pug that we couldn't even, there was just no fucking way. So we we stopped YouTube. We stopped making YouTube videos. Making YouTube videos is so hard, you guys. Like it, it takes so much effort and energy and I feel like your life has to be really stable or at least like semi-stable to actually create YouTube videos and YouTube content. So we stopped that, stopped Instagram, deleted TikTok, just kind of like went MIA and Jonas died uh, on April 28th. I feel like I've repeated that like a million times. I'm just gonna keep saying it. Jonas died on April 28th. Jonas died on April 28th, which is my mom's birthday, which is another story. After Jonas's death, I can't remember the exact date, but I think about, let's say six weeks after Jonas's death. So into June, cause all through May, it was kind of like my my floaty stage after Jonas died. I was dabbling in psychedelics and trying to process what had happened. Try I was trying to understand and accept that he was gone. It was my my processing month. I, I feel like it. I'm still processing. Um, I feel like it takes a long time to process after something like that, uh, losing something that significant in your life. But that's what I was doing. I was actively processing Jonas's death. And about six weeks after he died, when I was still very much in in the process of doing that and also trying to figure out how to come back to Instagram and also fulfilling these like thousands of sticker stickers that had sold for this Jonas sticker event. I was trying to figure out what to do next now that Jonas was gone while also giving myself the time and the space to just grieve and mourn and, and that kind of thing. We got an email from our landlord letting us know that she had sold the apartment building that Jesse and I had lived in for the past three and a half years. And we basically had until September 1st to like figure it out. And um, it was a position that we had always had a little bit of stress about being in the whole time we had lived there just as tenants and as renters. I feel like there's always that feeling of uncertainty. Like it, it's not, you don't own, I was gonna say, I don't know how much more security you have when you own a place just based on like the rising costs of insurance and, and mortgages and stuff like that. But as tenants, you're, you're at the mercy and at the will of someone else and what's going on in their life and we had seen it happening all around us when people were getting evicted and run evicted and so many people over the years we had watched just lose their homes and like beg people publicly for solutions or for places to live for them and their dogs and their pets and their kids and their families and we had heard so many countless stories of people just living in RVs in like alleyways because they had nowhere to live and I was like well we don't even have an RV like we don't even have that option we have like my Hyundai Tucson to like pack me and Jesse in the back in the pugs and like live in my Hyundai Tucson like we we didn't have any backups. Like we had nowhere to go. Like we had nowhere to go and no options whatsoever aside from like living in a tent, which I'm sure some people have done as well. So we instantly found ourselves in a position that we had been fearing for a while. We kind of knew it was coming. We had gotten some hints from our landlord that she had been thinking of selling for like a long time. Like probably the previous year, she had been intermittently kind of like, oh, I might sell. I don't know. I you know I'm in a position myself where I'm wondering if I should sell the 1896. But she kept telling us she wasn't gonna leave us high and dry. Like she told us that she had our backs and like she wasn't going to just like screw us over. And she actually did come up with a couple of other solutions aside from uh, selling it. She was looking for a partner where we were gonna be able to stay on as tenants. And then she, I don't know, she had a couple of other solutions for us over the years. She was just trying to figure it out. Like she's a good person that's shown up for Jesse specifically. Like Jesse and her are really, really close. So she's just a, a good person with a really, really good heart. And we knew that she wasn't going to just leave us like, well, it's not really her responsibility if we're homeless or not, but she just, she she want, wanted the best for us. She didn't just kick us out and not really care about it or anything like that. So anyway, the moment had arrived when we found ourselves in a position that we had seen so many other people in over the years and we literally had no idea what we were going to do. We were grateful that we had some time, but I think on top of continuing to process the the loss of, or the death of, of Jonas, being in a position where you know you're about to lose your home just kind of like adds an extra layer of, 
of stress and anxiety. I, I had faith that everything was going to work out and I also secretly felt like a little bit excited about it, even though I didn't know what was in front of me. Like I didn't know what was coming. The apartment had definitely served us for the amount of time it was supposed to. And I would actually say for a little bit longer than it was supposed to. We actually discovered black mold in the back room when Jonas was getting really, really sick. And we were trying to think if there was a correlation between the black mold and Jonas's symptoms. It turns out that there likely wasn't based on what we ended up finding out about him. But we were also thinking about the black mold in relation to our health. I had been struggling with chronic fatigue, like inexplainable chronic fatigue. Like I could barely even function. And I know it was from my grief. This was in the period after Jonas died to when we got our eviction notice. I just like couldn't stay awake. I had never felt that tired. It felt like I was perpetually PMSing. Like that, just like that fatigue that overcomes you and you have to nap, you have to sleep. And I'm not a napper really either. Or if you like swim a lot, or if you exert yourself a lot and you're actually like your whole body is physically exhausted, that's what I felt like. And we thought it might've been connected to the black mold and it probably was. And Jesse has like a kajillion random symptoms that he's still rectifying now that he is wondering is related to mold toxicity or mold poisoning. So the apartment was really old and it was falling apart. Like the, it was so drafty. Because of the draft, there was moisture and condensation. And we think there was mold around the baseboards and like around the windows. There was mold in, in the bl the black mold that we saw in on the ceiling in the back room. And uh, we also were having issues with mice infestations. There was mice in the walls. We could hear them like scattering around everywhere. We don't know what the hell was living down beneath us or what the air quality situation was down there that was like seeping through the baseboards and like the, the vents or whatever. Like the apartment itself also also wasn't the most like aesthetically pleasing inside. We kept it very cute and cozy for us, for sure. We had, you know, a really nice sectional, which is actually the sectional we have out on the deck here at the cabin. And we had like a cozy lamp and like the pug painting that's behind me here. And we, you know, we made it cozy and we kept it clean. And it was like very warm, safe, aside from the mold, safe, comfortable, happy home. So we were grateful for that. And we made the best of it while we had it. But it also had like five different types of floor like tile and like linoleum wood and like linoleum linoleum. The kitchen was a nightmare. If you guys follow along with me closely enough, you'll know that I'm like a foodie and I, I love being in the kitchen. It's my happy place. It was the most inadequate, horrible, awful, ugly kitchen I had ever, ever, ever lived in. It was horrible. I tried to keep it off camera like as much as I could because it was just heinous. Like it was so bad. It was so bad. It was so embarrassing. It functioned and it fed us and I have many, many happy memories of delicious meals and happy moments in the kitchen with Jesse and with the pugs. So there's there's no bad juju there. It was just fucking ugly. It was really, really ugly. And I, I just, the whole time I was there, I was like, oh, I wish if there was one thing I could change, it would be this kitchen. And you know, it, it just, it was time. Jesse and I stayed there for as long as we did because the rent was so incredibly cheap. The location was incredible. It was like literally across the street from the beach. I have so many memories in the summers, the three summers that we spent there of just walking across the street to Moye Beach at night in the dark before bed to jump in the lake with Jesse to cool off before we went to bed. So it was so, so, so hot. Towards the end, we ended up getting a window AC unit, but before we had the AC unit, we got the AC unit for Jonas towards the end because one of his symptoms was the inability to regulate his body temperature. But before we got the AC and got to have the benefits of the AC in there, we were walking across the street, jumping in the lake to cool off our own body temperatures before we went to bed. So I, I have so many good memories of being so close to the beach and just being so close to the lake and the water and being so close to town and, and all of that stuff. So the location was really unique, a once in a lifetime experience to live in that location, in that spot. As I mentioned before, we were also just really proud to live in the 1896 building. Like we loved telling people that. And, and I love that we now have that story that we can tell people that we lived there once upon a time for a few years, you know? So there's just, there's a lot of reasons why we stayed as long as we did. But yeah, the rent was extremely, extremely affordable for us and it served us really well in that regard as we kind of got our footing and as I dealt with my identity crisis between Calgary and the Coonies, that apartment was always a, a safe welcoming landing pad for me to come back to as I was figuring my shit out.
out back and forth between the city and um, Caslow and the Kootenays. But it was time. It was just, it was time. So I wasn't as upset about the eviction notice as I was excited about what was to come next because I really did have faith and trust in the process. I really did have just like this good feeling that something good was coming, even though there was this fear out in the world about the housing crisis and people not being able to find somewhere to live and people panicking about finding homes when they lose their tenancy as tenants, when they lose the place that they're living due to their landlord renovating or, or selling or whatever. I know that there are laws in BC about this stuff. Like I know that tenants are very protected in this regard. In our case, we were run evicted. So we were evicted because our landlord had sold the entire 1896 building to a buyer who intended to renovate the, like gut and renovate the entire building, the entire 1896 building. They wanted to renovate it and upgrade it, flip it, if you will, kind of is what the impression that I got. So I personally love when moments like this happen in my life because it's almost a permission slip for the next thing to come into my life. And that feels good when you have faith that it's going to be a better thing. I wasn't fearful at all when it happened. I actually, part of the excitement came from not knowing what was going to happen and knowing that we didn't have control over it. It kind of takes away that pressure of having to make a decision <laughs> in a way, being like, you know, having to, to put in that hard mental and emotional energy and work into like assessing the situation and thinking like, do we deserve better than this? Is this really, you know, the time where we have to put in the work and the financial financial commitment to finding somewhere new to live so that we can upgrade our lives. Like I love when unexpected changes happen like this because it is always a practice to strengthen my faith in knowing that something else outside of me is kind of controlling the, the flow of my life. And I just have to show up halfway to follow along with that flow, if that makes sense. Anyways, getting that eviction notice was exciting for me. And Jesse and I really came together as partners to sort of problem solve and come up with solutions and ideas and a plan for what we were going to do next. So I remember a day where we went to the Bluebell, which is this like sweet little cafe that was located right next door to the 1896 building. We got coffee and breakfast and we sat down at a beautiful table in the back of the coffee shop with a notebook. And we just wrote out all of our potential options or all of our potential avenues or action steps uh, or people that we could reach out to or things that we could um, consider. Like just, we were trying to open our minds expand our minds to all possibilities rather than staying in this narrow closed mindset of panic and fear and scarcity of like thinking that there was nothing available for us or that we wouldn't be able to find a place with the dogs with Fern and Ivy or that you know there's a housing crisis or like there's nothing available or like look at everybody else struggling or this is the worst possible time for this to happen how are we going to afford it it's so expensive we don't have the money we didn't want to stay in that frequency like in that vibration because we know better than that like Things can't, opportunities can't come to you and doors can't open for you if you're staying in this mindset of staying close to any opportunities coming your way, like of, just, of being in an energy of just like, no, like we know there's nothing. It's kind of like what whatever you believe to be true is true. And so we chose to believe that there were plenty of options and that this was an exciting time. And we just wanted to keep our minds wide open to possibilities even outside of like our immediate area. So we opened it up to like basically anywhere. We were even thinking of Alberta. Like we were like, maybe this is the time that we move to Alberta together and we go back to Alberta together. Like maybe the, I don't know, maybe, maybe like, Maybe <laughs> we were thinking about the East Kootenays and like moving out of the West Kootenays to the East, to like the Creston area, kind of over that way. We were thinking of all different types of housing, like sharing land with other people. We were just trying to stay open to it all. We didn't want to close anything off. Even if some things were like not preferable or like not our first choice, we just wanted to keep it open. So we wrote a big list with all of our available options. Before Jesse and I had the chance to take action on any of the things that we had listed in that notebook that day at the coffee shop, Jesse got an email from our landlord from the realtor, from Jesse's photography and videography realtor client, letting us know that she had a lead on a property just outside of Caslow. So it was the, the cabin owners who had contacted her. And from what I understand, they actually were looking to sell or put it back on the market. I think they were kind of in a spot where they were thinking about what to do because they had bought it from this realtor five or six years ago before the pandemic. And I think they were thinking about letting it go. So they were, they were wondering what they should do. Our landlord, this realtor said to them that 
that she had recently just sold her property and she had two amazing tenants that were looking for somewhere to live if they would be open to the idea or the possibility of renting the cabin instead of putting it on the market and selling it. So the owners of the cabin have never actually rented to tenants before. They did buy the property as a buy and hold and they did buy it with the intention of renting it out as an Airbnb, which is extremely common out here. Everybody does it, it's kind of a problem. I know there's some Airbnb regulations or, or rules that kind of came out, but I, I don't quite know the details and it's irrelevant to the story anyways, but they had never rented to tenants before. They live over in Alberta. So they actually own the cabin as their second property uh, remotely from the province that I came from <laughs> over in Alberta in BC's neighboring province of Alberta. We contacted the owners of the cabin property to ask a couple of questions and just have a discussion with them about what a potential tenancy arrangement with them would look like. And we figured out a way to come and see the cabin on our own without them being here. So they live in Alberta, which is, they live in Edmonton actually, which is probably like a good 10 or 12 hours away from where we are here at the cabin. So it's far, it's really far away and that's where they were. And we found a way for us to come up here and get a key from somebody to come into the cabin and do like a self-guided walkthrough to check it out and kind of see what the situation was. And when Jesse and I first drove out here, we are about, it's about a 20 minute drive from the 1896 from where we were living. When we got in the car to come out here and find the address, and when we were driving up the driveway, it was actually the moment that we hit the driveway where I was like, no way. Like there's, there's no turning back from this. This is it. Like we haven't even looked at anything else. We haven't even like pursued anything else. And uh, the cabin, based on what we had talked to the property owners about was definitely a little bit out of our, our price range based on our preliminary conversation. And also more than that, the more the cabin came into view and the more we started to take in of the property itself, the more we started to realize the responsibility of moving onto a property like this and the work that would go into maintaining a property like this. So when we went up the driveway, it was completely overgrown. The forest had just taken over. Like there were weeds scraping under the car. The trees had come in. They were like banging on the window and uh, it was just going into the thick of the forest. Like there hadn't been anyone there doing yard maintenance for a while. And uh, we pulled in and as we kind of, the driveway is very, very long. If you've seen the, the shoveling bit. <laughs> videos that I've been sharing. The more we pulled through the forest and the, the more the property started to reveal itself and the cabin started to come into view, I don't think I've ever instantly fell in love with something aside from like Jonas that quickly. It's hard to explain. It, it was, this cabin was made for me. <laughs> I don't even own it. Like we're, we were not even looking to buy it. But when I saw it, it was just like the manifestation of so much. If you look at Gremlin Farm's logo, I'll put it up on the screen. When I saw it, the, rea the reality of the possibility of me living in this cabin at the time when we were just viewing it, to me was the manifestation of Gremel Farms logo. I had created Gremel Farms logo in 2020 when I first moved out to the Coonies, created it exactly the way that it is, it hasn't changed. And I felt like driving up this driveway and the cabin revealing itself and just the location of it and where it is. I have an aerial that Jesse took with his drone actually that I can maybe put on the screen right now to show you with the logo. <laughs> this is literally Gremlin Farms logo manifested. And there are so many other little details that I, I hope I can efficiently bring to light for you when I start to share these different little chapters of my story leading up to being here at the cabin, but the significance of being here and the significance of all of the bracken ferns that line the driveway and that like just completely cover the south part of the property and all of the little signs of, just all the little signs of Jonas that are here, like, and Chloe, like I haven't quite introduced like the woo woo, I hate the word woo woo, but like I haven't quite introduced like the part of myself that like really deeply believes in the sync, like the magical synchronicities of life and just the, the metaphors and the meaning of the things that the universe shows me, shows us. Becoming aware of those things and, and the way that they have guided my life, just paying attention and picking up on like little signs that God and the universe has sent me along my path. There were so many of them at the cabin that it was just, it was, it just filled my body and my bones with certainty that this was where I was meant to be. And I couldn't even believe it. It was a, a really surreal moment when we first pulled up and I saw it, it was perfect. It was everything I had dreamed of, <laughs> like as a, as a, a home and just as a lifestyle and um, everything. 
in in nature and yeah I, I couldn't really believe it it definitely didn't seem real uh, or like a real possibility it was almost like the universe was teasing me a little bit seeing if I was ready to commit without fleeing and abandoning Jesse and going back to the city <laughs> without him I think the universe was testing me and really wanted me to know if if this is what I wanted I also really think that Jonas and Chloe conspired together up there to send this to me because they knew it would make me so happy but yeah, there was still the shock of the increase in our rent. It was it was double. Uh, and there was the adjustment of all of the other costs and expenses that come with living rurally, which I can probably go over in another video, but it's just extremely, extremely expensive in ways that you wouldn't even really think. And then there was the knowing that there was going to be so much work in harvesting deadfall and wood and getting prepared for winter, heating the wood stove. And there was gonna be so much property maintenance, so much work, so much yard work, just general maintenance of something like a cabin like this, where things are constantly breaking or you constantly have to come up with solutions to fix stuff it's just a lot of work and it's a lot of upkeep and it's a lot of um it's a, it's a huge commitment to live on a property like this the cabin is on 18 acres there's only an acre or two that's actually usable the rest of it is like sheer rock face like mountain behind us but still it's like it's a big property and jesse has worked in real estate doing photography and videography for like hundreds and hundreds of properties here in the kootenays and he has met and spoken to so many people that are selling their acreages and selling their properties. And I can't even tell you the number of times that people have shared with him their reasons for selling. It's because they can't, they're getting older and they can't keep up with the work that maintaining a property like this one actually takes on a person, like mentally, physically, in all the ways. So Jesse and I are obviously, you know, young and, and able-bodied and, and able to do that kind of work, but it's a huge time commitment and it takes a lot of resources and a lot of investment to actually commit to keeping up with a property like this. So those were some of the things that were at the forefront of our mind when we moved here. Just trying to like think if this was something that we really wanted to commit to, but I knew deep down, like I knew in my bone marrow, <laughs> like my deep, deep, deep intuition was like, holy shit, this, like, this is it. Like this moment has arrived for me to actually live in like my dream home in like a dream location. So I knew that I wanted it. And I have, I have a funny clip of Jesse. I had my phone out and I was kind of doing a panorama of the cabin and of the property. And I zoomed in on him and you can just see like the wheels in his head turning. He's thinking about all these things and thinking about the reality and like just the responsibility. So you're probably, he's probably thinking of all the things that need to be done in this video, but it was so funny just to see his brain working that way. And uh, we got to go inside the cabin. And once I saw the inside of it, like I could have just passed out. Like I, I swear, <laughs> I swear. And the property owners, the cabin owners had cameras like set up all inside and all outside because they watch it from Alberta and just keep an eye on it on their phones or whatever. And so as we were going through the cabin they were they were watching us go through it and um they said they could just hear me being like oh my god are you fucking kidding me like all of my reactions they were just laughing listening to me at my reaction to it so once i got in here it's furnished so like rustically but just the layout of it it is the cutest freaking place like I've ever seen in my life. The archway back here is probably one of my favorite parts of it. The east facing decks, there's a lower one and an upper one. They face, I don't know which direction this is. It's kind of north, it's heading south, it's sort of in the middle. Co Kootenai Lake, like a massive, massive expanse of Kootenai Lake is right there. And then the mountains behind it. And then there's a loft. There's a loft upstairs in a second bedroom. Our bedroom's down here. And uh, the way that it's perched up really high on the mountain with Kootenai Lake kind of far away, down below, and even looking out here, because it's so high and it's on a hill, it feels like I'm in a tree house. That's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a little log cabin tree house perched up in the trees with the birds. That's what it feels like. It feels like I'm flying when I'm up here. It's such a unique space and it's such a unique home. And once I got to peek inside of it and I got to see the beautiful like country kitchen back there with the south facing window bay with the sunshine and just the view off the decks and the view off the kitchen window facing east where the sun rises and the whole property and the loft space which we now use as our office it's my favorite space in the whole entire cabin everything about it I just I, there was there was no way I was going to be able to say no and then move into some fucking I don't know what we would have found out there right now we would have found something and it would have worked but I would have been dreaming about this cabin till the day I died and I felt like it, this was the first and only opportunity I was going to have to be able to have the experience of living in a place that I was proud to live and living in a place that I was just so deeply 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 in love with and 
and proud to be in, I had to grab it. I just, I had to do it. I didn't know, I didn't really know how it was gonna work or how we were going to figure it out, but I had faith in that we were supposed to be here. And this is when Jesse and I really started talking about how we could take advantage of being here to create content and create videos and actually show up more on Grummel Farms uh, YouTube channel and, and Instagram and, and whatever, being in this beautiful space and being able to create the things that we've been creating here so far. So we were in contact with the property owners for a few weeks after we had done our self-guided like tour, self-guided viewing. And there were quite a few details to work out because basically the owners of the property were hoping to find tenants. First of all, that would be up for the task because it's a very unique living situation. And I think being from Edmonton, like they're city folks, they're the nicest people, but they use this cabin as their second property and they came out every once in a while, but I don't think that they, they don't live here full time for a reason like they they had their jobs and their lives in Edmonton so I think they really just wanted to find tenants that were the right type of tenants who wanted to live this kind of lifestyle and not a tenant who maybe thought it was going to be easier but thought that the cabin was pretty and just like wanted to live here because it's a cool place to live there's actually a lot of work to be done so there was just like a lot of conversations to be had and a lot of things to talk about regarding what this place needed kind of like its unique problems or issues or nuances that we would have to live with and, and deal with with and manage living in a place like this. Thankfully, Jesse has a lot of experience living this kind of lifestyle. I am very much learning as I go along, but uh, I feel like I, I'm taking Jesse's lead a lot of the time. But there was a lot of just planning and a lot of conversations, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, um, a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of insurance, uh, like stuff that they had to figure out on their end since they'd never had tenants before. There was a lot of drama with our wood stove that we had to get wet certified. Um, it wasn't certified to be used um, legally. So we had to get that sorted, which was kind of a bit of drama. This was before our most recent carbon monoxide situation that I shared about in a, in a previous video. So there was just a lot of specifics and like technical stuff to cut that we sort of, and like logistics that we had to sort out before they actually sent over the lease agreement and we signed the lease. So there was a period of like maybe three or four weeks where we weren't entirely sure if it was like secure, like we weren't, it didn't really seem real. It could fall through at any moment. We were working out our rental uh, arrangement or our rental agreement. And it, it turns out that one of the, the biggest reasons aside from me, like it being a non-negotiable thing for me and just saying like we'll figure it out I just have to live there was that we made an arrangement with the property owners that Jesse and I would exchange some physical labor for like a little bit of reduced rent each month there is just so many projects and so many tasks that the property owners were never able to get around to and just a lot of work that needs to be done just general work around the property and stuff like that so we had agreed to kind of tackle a few things every month in exchange for variable like reduced rent each month based on how much work we did so that was a really positive conversation conversation and agreement that we came to with the, the cabin owners. So we had to work through that and the logistics of that and what that looked like. And towards the middle, of, beginning middle of August, we finally signed the lease and it became official for us. The property owners actually ended up traveling out from Alberta to stay at the cabin. They came separately. So she came first and I came up here to meet her. And then he came second and we came up to meet him a couple of times. So we could just get an official tour and kind of like hang out with them and meet them and get to know them a little bit and stuff like that. We were total strangers that were going to be staying in their cabin for the very first time as their very first tenants. So I think they just wanted to establish a connection and a bit of a rapport with us before they actually handed over the keys. So there was a couple of weeks of just, you know, back and forth of that and like coming here and, and spending some time with them and um, get, you know, getting a tour of the place and figuring out just all of the little details, asking questions and, and stuff. It just like the process went on forever. But we signed our lease and then um, we were able to move in about a week earlier so at the end of August, the final week of August, they said it would be okay if we started moving our stuff up to store here. So the last week of August was this big transitionary period between packing up our stuff, kind of like all the normal things you do when you make a big move. Like we sold stuff, I donated stuff, we purged, I did a lot of purging, organizing, repacking stuff, putting them in bins and boxes and just that transitionary stage of like living amongst your things and, and uh, slowly downsizing and, and getting everything prepared to move. So the moving week was probably the most exciting week like of my life or one of them. I couldn't believe, I just couldn't believe it was happening. And I wasn't sharing any of this on Instagram.
Instagram. And I have always been one to share the things that really, really excite me and that just like really, really light me up and get me going. Those are some of my favorite things to share. And the fact that I wasn't sharing this move with Instagram was like the weirdest experience because I have shared it all throughout my life, but I was sharing it with our patrons. I was sharing it on our private Patreon Instagram page. I shared everything. Every day I documented it. I, unfortunately, I didn't document it for YouTube because I wasn't in YouTube brain at the time for that move, but I shared so many videos and, and photos and Instagram stories and Patreon posts and all the details of moving up here that week. So it was a, it was a tumultuous week. So that week was crazy. Moving moving up to the cabin and just the whole transition and the back and forth, but it could not have come any sooner because the family that had bought the 1896 building was from the States and they came up for the entire month of August. It actually probably started a little bit earlier in July, but the end of July and all through August until the minute we pulled out of the driveway, like the second we pulled out of the driveway, the last time at the 1896 building, our, our apartment, that we had lived in for three and a half years, they decided to just come in and start demolition on the whole building at the end of July. I think at the end of July, they came up and started like sussing out the, the space and they had like a cert, like a inspector guy come and like take a look at everything. And then they just like went into the building and they started gutting it. So at the end of July, beginning of August. So this whole month when we were trying to figure out our, our exit and like secure the cabin, they came up as a family. It's a huge family. So they were just hanging out in our yard like all day from like eight o'clock in the morning until like into the evening hours. There were kids and like wives and aunts and uncles and men and women and just like dozens of people hanging out in our yard, having like family meetings and like talk. I think it was a family purchase. Purchasing the H-96 was a family investment, but they were all involved in it. And so they were all there, but it was a group of like five or six men that were there doing like a full blown demolition on the H-96 before we even moved out. And uh, it became impossible to do anything. We couldn't work, we couldn't focus, we couldn't concentrate, we couldn't, we, we were immobile. Like we couldn't, it was, it, we couldn't do anything. I, I'm having a hard time even describing really what was happening down there that last month in August before we moved to the cabin, but it felt to me kind of symbolic because everything was crumbling. Like literally the 1896 building was crumbling away. The frame, like the brick frame was still there, but it was like being gutted from the inside. The two people in the front moved out earlier than we did and they just went in there with all kinds of machinery like heavy equipment and they gutted everything, everything down to the brick wall. So they were pulling out everything like PVC pipe, metal, bathtubs, sinks, plumbing, electrical. There was even a time when like the, the owner sent me a text. We had connected before just to like meet each other and say hello and exchange numbers as we were making our transition out of the building. And he had sent me a text in the morning being like, hey, is your guys, is, is your guys' light still on? Is your electricity still on? I think I might've like cut the electricity down here because they were just doing like crazy construction. Like they were like just literally gutting the entire place, everything, everything. And uh, our lights were flickering and and um, they were pulling out the the floor and the ceiling. So they were pulling out like the wall, the floor, the ceiling, everything, every single thing. And our apartment was shaking and vibrating. And I literally thought at one point that like it was possible that we might fall through the floor. It was so crazy. And that the yard beside us, which was kind of our only space to let the pugs to, out to go to the bathroom, just became full of shrapnel and nails and garbage and insulation and metal pieces and scraps. And you know, they had tr big trailers coming in and out because they were taking away all of this hazardous building material. And I don't know what they shook up down there. Like, I'm not sure, like I mentioned asbestos before, but like there was more, 100%, 110% there was mold down there for sure. So they're probably shaking up all this mold that was like coming up into our apartment. We got an infestation of wasps towards the end. Our place was just freaking filled with wasps. I think they disturbed a nest that had been in the unit beneath us as well. Mice started coming up again, so they probably disturbed some like some mouse nests down there. And then on the final day that we moved out, the very final day, like the last day of August in the morning, we had slept on an air mattress in the bedroom and then, you know, mopped our way out of our apartment, locked the door. We went to go find the the guy. He was the, the dad figure in this purchase, family purchase arrangement. We went to go find him because he was there every day with his son, who was the actual person who, who bought the building. His name was on the contract or whatever. We went to go find him to give him the apartment keys. This was early in the morning, maybe like nine o'clock in the morning. And when we went down the stairs and Jesse and I looked at each other and took a deep breath and said, okay, 
Like, let's go find him and hand off the keys and that's officially it. That will be our time at the 1896 building. We went around the corner to try and look for the dad. And he came rushing out of the door to the unit beneath us, completely soaked in water. And he was panicking. Like he, I think he was in like a state of shock. He wasn't able to like say hello to us or interact with us or really understand why we were there. Cause he was pulling out his phone and fumbling around with his phone and trying to figure out. And when he realized that like we were there and what we were there for to like say goodbye and give him the keys, he had mentioned that he had just burst the water main from whatever he was trying to, to pull out. I, I get the impression they weren't, these people weren't construction workers and they weren't doing this demolition legally. They didn't get the permits that they needed to do this. They just kind of went in there and just like gave her and it um, was a, a really scary situation. So anyway, he burst the water main the day that we were moving out, which would have affected us greatly as tenants upstairs. And he needed to contact someone from the village of Caslow to come and help him like stop the building from flooding. And so he was in a state of panic about that. And he ran, like he ran down the street to go and find someone to come and help him. And so we just kind of stood there like twiddling our thumbs waiting for him to come back. And uh, this guy from the village Caslow like sped up to the 1896 building in a little tractor, I think like a little s utility vehicle and uh, went inside to go and like problem solve this water main, this like flooding risk. And uh, we were kind of just like, hey, like here, here's your keys. You can have these, like see you later, bye. And he was just so out of it. Like it just was the most awkward, like it was the most awkward interaction ever. We got in the, the car and um, we had Fern and Ivy with us, of course. And we made our very last trip up to the cabin to actually like sleep there for the first night and uh, start our new, our new chapter or our new journey up here at the cabin, like a, a fresh start for, uh, you know, a life without Jonas. Uh, um, my reality in my post Joni world all started when we moved up here to the cabin. That is kind of the story of the 1896 building and the apartment that Jesse and I lived in when we first moved out to the Kootenays in 2020. It is definitely a part that many people missed out on. It's a part that I haven't shared with anybody but our patrons. So I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to share that era of living in the 1896 building in Caslow and uh, sort of the, the beginning of moving up and out here to the cabin. I am going to create a part two to this video. So originally it was going to be part one, Jonas's death story didn't happen. And then part two, living at the 1896 and our move to the cabin. But I think what I'm gonna do is split this video up into two. So today I told the story of the 1896 building and the apartment that Jesse and I moved into with Jonas, Fern and Ivy when we first moved out to the Kootenays. And I think in the next video, what I'll do is I'll share about those first few weeks when we moved into the cabin because I shared that privately with our patrons as well. And those first few weeks when we moved into the cabin were extra special because we were heading into the fall, September 1st till about the third week of September. And we had so many bears in our backyard and the apples were in season and it was still so sunny and warm and beautiful. So I actually took a lot of footage of the work that Jesse and I did when we got here, like the yard work and hanging out on the deck and uh, just all of the stuff we did when we first got here and all of the stuff we experienced before winter actually got here, <laughs> which has been a whole different experience. But I want to share that with you guys because I feel like a lot of you missed it and it was a very exciting period of time when we first moved up here and we're experiencing it with fresh eyes and uh, fresh minds and fresh hearts and we were just so excited and happy to be here so i'm gonna create a part two to this video that actually shares about the cabin and then in that video is probably when i'll officially take you guys on a cabin tour so i'll do an actual cabin tour of everything i just explained in this video of the cabin where i can show you the loft and the second a-frame bedroom and the decks and the view and i'll take you guys around to the front where you can see the mine we have a mine on our property and just a couple different views of, of the cabin and just the property in general um take you guys for a little walk tour but i'll save that for the next video after this one or the next video sometime i'll, I'll share it in a in a, in, a, in another video i have a q a that i want to do after this but anyway i'll share the cabin stuff in part two if you guys are interested in supporting jesse and i and the girls out here at the cabin you can do that by sending a donation over to our ko-fi page or buying us a coffee in a previous video i called it ko-fi because i was reading it phonetically and it's hard to not pronounce it ko-fi but it's ko-fi ko-fi.com slash 
slash Gremel Farm. I'll leave the link below in the description. You can send a one-off donation or you can send uh, or sign up to do a monthly recurring donation. Either of them are so greatly appreciated. What I love about Kofi is that you can leave a public comment and it's kind of this really beautiful thread of just people saying super nice things that you can engage with and read as you go through. There's also a couple other features on there, but Kofi has been amazing. I've been really enjoying my experience on there and we've gotten, uh, I think like 75 coffees on there so far, which is just amazing. It's felt so loving and supportive. And whenever I get a notification to say that I someone bought me a coffee, it just like fills me with so much joy. So thank you to everyone who's donated. And if you wanted to send us a donation to support the videos and the stories that I'm tr like trying to share, you can do it on ko-fi.com slash grumble farm, which I'll, I'll put below. And then joining us on Patreon, of course, I'm always going to remind you guys that you can join us on Patreon. I promise it is the most beautiful community you will ever be a part of on the internet. You don't have to have a pug to join us. Seriously, there are people without pugs. You do have to love dogs and you do have to love nature and you do want to have to support Jesse and I and Grumble Farm and you do have to want to be uh, a little bit, come a little bit closer to us. If you want to have a, a bit of a closer relationship to us, if you want to be sort of in the inner circle of uh, everything that Jesse and I are doing for Grumble Farm, then I would highly, highly, highly suggest joining Patreon. I make um, some some like exclusive behind the scene posts on there. I share photos and stories and writing and, and uh, stuff like that on there pretty regularly. That's only available to paying patrons. There are six tiers there that you can choose from starting from literally just $5 a month Canadian. So it's like $3.60 US or something like that per month. And you can pay annually on that one, which a lot of people choose to do. So those are two ways that you can support Jesse and I and the girls and Grummel Farm. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are trying to grow this channel and qualify to be eligible for YouTube's partner program. So if you subscribe and hit the notification bell and watch our videos when you get the notification that they're live, that would really help us out in that regard. We're trying to get our watch hours up. So yeah, I think that's about it. And aside from that, I love you. And thank you for your time and for your attention and for allowing the space for me to share this part of my story. Sorry if it was long. I will see you in the next video, which will likely be about the cabin and sharing about moving up here and giving you guys a cabin tour. So I'll see you then. Bye you guys.